I'm Alex and I'm really lucky actually I think to have come after these two guys because I think hopefully this will bring together a lot of the themes. I mean definitely selective breeding, genetics plays into disease, definitely intensive versus extensive but actually they go much much deeper than that and hopefully you can start picking out some of those things as well. It, it will feel I think a bit like I'm the bad cop um, because both of these are about maximising production, whereas I kind of, this is probably going to feel like what goes wrong, okay? Where all the problems happen. But it's not that. It's just another one of these variables, another one of these uncertainties to kind of bring us, bring us into. Um, so what we're going to do very briefly today is we're going to look at some of the language around diseases as well. Because when you're engaging with the topics, there is a very specific, particularly Western scientific language that comes with disease. And I want you to be able to kind of break that down and break into it a bit. Secondly, we're going to look at a few kind of key diseases. And they're not really because I want you to know those diseases. They're just useful lenses and examples, as some of the examples we've come up previously, for thinking about topics. And then some of the bigger debates, we'll kind of bring it back into uncertainty and pastoralism at the end. Um, I will recognise, I know there are some non-native English speakers here. I get very excited about diseases. If I go too quick, put your hand up and I'll slow down. Um, I'll try and stay slow, but if you can't hear, just say. There are two other things. Um, one is that... Where I've used technical language, which I think is of use, it's in italics, and I think the slides are being circulated. Is that right? And the second thing is, there are examples of uh, diagnostic techniques in here. So there are some images which are a bit less happy. If you've got problems with it, we'll move on quickly. It's not a. It's just a, a, a caveat and public public safety announcement. Um, so again, we've only got limited time to cover what is quite a big topic, but. If you think about some of the diseases that you might have come across or some of the ones you might have heard in the press, you can start to build up a picture of how diverse livestock disease is. And particularly for this presentation, I'm going to be talking about infectious or communicable diseases. There are, of course, a massive wealth of things like metabolic diseases, diseases of genetics or condition. But all these things tie in. So hopefully this is your starting point into that bigger debate. But we're going to be looking at infectious. Now, there's a, a paper from 2009 that I picked up, which is about pro -poor, livestock diseases and the pro-poor kind of movement. And I, I just scalped it and did a quick word cloud, cloud and I'm sure you're familiar with word clouds. And this is obviously is pro-poor understandings, and this is what we came up with. And this is one paper, and you can see there's quite a lot in there. And a lot of the language that pops up is very heavily rooted in the technical side. And this is Perry and Grace, and I've got a copy of the paper if you want it. But actually, you might be familiar with some of these, but some of them may not be familiar with you. And then what we're going to try and think about is how you break that down in your work, how you kind of disaggregate it, and what, what's your way into this huge soup of terms that often livestock diseases turn out with. And so if we look at classic ways of differentiating livestock disease, uh, which you may have come across, may not be familiar with, we can consider a whole raft of different ways in, a whole raft of options you've got. And I've popped up there some of the more common ones. So we can look at diseases by species, by prevalence, by transmission routes, by effect, and bear in mind, we'll dig into a bit, effect on whom, for what, how, where, and there are two terms there, morbidity and mortality. Um, now, if you're not familiar with them, the easiest way of thinking about morbidity and mortality here is morbidity is the, the state of being diseased and mortality is the state of being dead. Yeah. OK, so if we use those as broad conceptual groups here, we, we can dig into this a bit more as well. Um, and then we've got impact and detection and diagnosis. Now, I've broken detection and diagnosis apart here because they are different things, but people in particularly te um, some texts will conflate the two. Um, treatments, there's a whole range. You can see how you could make this list bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, for today, I'm going to focus on three ways of categorising diseases, and I'm actually going to bring out three specific diseases, which are cattle diseases of sub-Saharan Africa. But that does not mean that the concepts we're talking about are limited to that. Okay, you'll see it's a much bigger debate than that. But the three um, uh, kind of factors we're going to be dealing with are agents, hosts, and vectors. Okay, again, that's a specific language, and they're in italics there, so you know that that is the specific language. You may find them called other things, but these are broad groups. So agents, okay, there's a lovely picture of some green wigglies up there. Uh, if you start digging into the literature, you'll see lots of pictures down a microscope of wiggly things, which used to illustrate concepts that people have problems with. Now, agents are more easily thought about for us as kind of organisms or structures that cause disease. Okay, should be something you can, if you have a two minute thought, you can probably think about it quite clearly. 
And so bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, quite good examples. But I've put toxins on there as well. So um, you may have heard of tetanus. Tetanus is a disease for those non English because it's kind of lock or lock jaw in cattle. I um, mean, people get it as well. Now, Clostridium tetani is the bacteria that causes it. But actually, that's not the problem. It's the tetanus toxin. It's the toxin that's made by the bacteria. And these are really quite important things because if you think about how you treat it or how you present it, uh, prevent against it, it's not just the bacteria you're worried about. It's the thing that the bacteria is making. These are complex systems which are interrelated. Even within fodders, fodders left on the floor to mature can either mature or rot. And that has a very different effect of what's going to happen. Okay. So that's an agent. Everyone happy with an agent? It's the thing that causes it, but it need not be a bug per se. Got hosts. Okay, so hosts. In this case, we're going to think about animals. It's livestock disease after all, with, within which the agent resides. But, and we've talked about this previously, I really would caution, and Michaela's work started this, but I think I'm going to back it up. Don't get species myopia. Because you're interested in yaks, doesn't mean that the dogs that follow the people, the birds that do droppings, or the snakes under the rocks aren't involved in those disease cycles, okay? Because you're interested in disease, open your eyes out, don't get that narrowness of vision, because this all ties in, okay? Pets, wildlife, vermin, everything, all these things can be quite closely interlinked. And then vectors. Now, that's a tick. Uh, yeah. It's a UK-based tick. <laughs> it's, um, anyone who's walked in the UK much will be very familiar with these, and long trousers particularly. Um, and a vector in this case is the means by which an agent is transferred. Okay, so it's the way which that agent gets to that host, in this case. Now, the classic ones you hear about are ticks and mosquitoes, but if you think a bit closer, and as Ian said, we're going to break down some of these concepts, actually, in a lot of cases, it's blood that could be a vector, but mosquitoes and ticks not only act as the mechanism by which they're transferred, that disease can be replicating within the vector. Okay, and one of the diseases we're going to come up with, you're going to see how the disease is actually multiplies within the flies and mosquito vectors in which we're using. So it's not a passive way of transferring a disease. It's part of the process. Okay, great. So we've got those three kind of concepts um, and to kind of illustrate them, particularly for an uncertainty partialist point of view, we're going to deal with trypanosomiasis and there'll be a test at the end on how you can pronounce that. Okay, um, which is a parasite. There's Rift Valley fever. RVF, which is a virus you may have heard of, and contagious bovine pleura pneumonia, again, another test, um, CBPP, okay, which is a bacteria. So if you can see, those are three different agents there, and we're going to try and pick out how they differ, how, what the similarities are between each one. And again, you get the slides, so don't worry about the spellings for now. So TRIPS, Pronsomiasis. That animal does not have a floating sign above it. It hasn't developed a series of spots down its side that spell out that disease, okay? It has trypanosomiasis, but if you look at it from a more objective view, it's thin, yeah. it looks slightly depressed, it's living in close contact with its owner, as far as we know at this point, but there is nothing what's called pathognomonic, okay? There's nothing specific to that disease that says, that's what it's got, because I would be out of a job. If everything came up with a little lump on it that said that's exactly what it is, the, the, the monitoring side of things would be much easier. So, so trips. Sleeping sickness, uh, African animal trypanosomiasis or Nagana, there are hundreds of other animals, uh, other, other animals, other names for it. Particularly in your local vernaculars or your local context, you ought to be able to understand what people mean by this if there is a commonality there. So there are 30 species of trips, it's not just one, and the incubation could be anywhere from 4 to 40 days. Now, the reason for bringing this out is you can see it's not one thing. It's not, oh great, he's got it, there's your treatment. Okay, so it's a more problematic disease than that. And the clinical signs, so what we actually see, go from fever to death. Death is easier to spot. Okay, you can get weight loss, abortion. There's a whole range of signs here, non-specific, but if you think about it, some of us may have had some of those. We're probably unlikely to have had pronosmiasis. It is zoonotic. Okay, now zoonotic is a term that you, if you're not already familiar with, I would very much appreciate you becoming familiar with, because it means transferable to humans. And it underpins a lot of the One Health approach that you may be familiar with or coming in contact with. And actually, it's, again, a watchword when we start looking at literatures or funding at the moment. So we know these are more, becoming more and more important with emerging diseases. And mammals can be chronic carriers with intermittent shedding, which means if you do not die of it, you can keep it with you and you can keep chucking it out. 
There's a, there's, the term in animal cases for this is a PI, or persistently infected. And actually, particularly if you had herds that take sardinia, for example, which are constantly underproducing, you need to start looking for what's called your PIs, your persistently infected. And how people understand this to work, how the farmers, the herders, the shepherds understand one or two animals that maybe is constantly causing the whole herd, the whole flock to be sick, becomes quite interesting as well. So the vector for trypanosomiasis, uh, again, I would ask, but it's uh, tsetse fly, yeah? Everyone, everyone may have heard of this, okay? Which is Glossina. And again, another big family. So there were 30 types of trips over. There are now 23 types of tsetse fly. And I picked out the three biggest there. Again, you don't need to know the names. But really to point out that, yes, they're all in forests. But each one's in a slightly different type of forest, which gives us a slightly different profile and a slightly different understanding of how this disease is going to work. And actually, as we said previously, it's not the Hetzi fly that's the problem per se, it's the blood in which the parasite's in, which means we now know that horse flies, other flies we get all around Northern Europe, if they feed on the blood shortly after being bitten by a Hetzi fly, they also can transfer the disease. So if we're thinking about our understanding of where this disease comes from, the complexity increases, increases, increases. Okay? And flies, fly, flies, flies, the parasite can stay within the parasite after that 15 to 21 day cycle. Okay, you don't need to know the specifics, but just think about it on a two to three week basis, the parasite is replicating within the fly and yet it can stay there afterwards. And what does that mean for that woodland that you may be working within? What does that mean for that area? Okay, so the diagnosis of trypanosomiasis is a microscope of live or dead animals. Think about the number of microscopes that may be around the people you're working with. You can do what's called a PCR, polymerase chain reaction. It's a posh test. It's quite expensive. That's available in Northern Europe and developed countries typically and other areas. But it's specific to Australian species. It doesn't screen generally. Three drugs exist for its existence. There is no vaccine. But species, come back to Michaeli's point, species are becoming more and more tolerant. We understand that certain species are able to resist this more than others. It is endemic in some of these areas. And you may not come across that term. It means it resides within an area and is known to exist there. Okay, so endemicy, again, if we think about transhumans or mobility, moving in and out of endemic areas, what does that mean for our understanding of disease versus a settled herd, for example? And the approach to getting rid of it at a national level is typical stamping out. You quarantine or you cull. Again, socioculturally, let's we'll start thinking about what this means for us at this point. Yeah, like I said, some breeds, there is evidence to show that you can be tolerant to trypanosomiasis. That was the big trot through trips, okay? It's a big thing and it will come up on most lists see. But if we move to Rift Valley Fever, which remember is a, a, a virus, it's, a, it's a, a part of a bigger family of viruses. Again, don't worry about the Latin. But now we've got a 12-hour incubation period, 4 to 40 days, yet we have another agent which is similarly non-specific, which can replicate on a 12-hour basis. You get 80 to 100% abortion in a herd, typically, with Rift Valley Fever. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean that all the adults die, but we're now starting to see those effects of a disease projected onto productive potential rather than loss of the animal specifically themselves. There's a high morbidity and mortality rate. We talked about that previously. You've got infected and you're likely to die from it. It's also zoonotic, a lot of parallels. But it's spread by a mosquito. And whereas we said that those flies, the tsetse flies, were divided in the forest, what we have with the mosquito spread here is if your precipitation cycle in these areas typically is on a five to 25 year cycle, you can have nothing for two decades, then a massive explosive outbreak. And that's usually tied to the fact that animals within that area have not been exposed, haven't got a background resistance. So you have a huge number of naive animals, a sudden explosion in the mosquito population and a massive problem. And how you deal with that uncertainty, how you deal with that risk, you can see that the two diseases may make you make very different decisions about what you're going to do if you believe them to exist in that area. And just to point out some of the control measures and the difficulties, there is a live vaccine for this. Okay? And live and uh, inactivated vaccines are different things. We, again, no need to go into it here. But a live vaccine, if you inject that vaccine, you'll get three years of immunity. And you'll potentially abort sheep that you're vaccinating at that point. There is an inactivated vaccine, which gets no unwanted effects, but you need multiple doses to get that same resistance. Think about, in your cases, how that management may change, how your access may change, and what that means for those individual herders. And this is a phrase you'll probably only hear from vets and pathologists, but they has a lovely pair of lungs on that screen, okay? That's a really beautiful set of lungs there, okay? <laughs> those, are, those are cow lungs, okay? CBPP gives you those lungs, okay? You get these tracts. Now, CBPP is a bacterial disease, 
and it tracks through the lung and other tissues. And actually it's spread by cough. So previously we've had two different vectors. Now this is a, a cough-based disease. It literally breathing around these animals can cause these kind of problems, along with reproduction of other body fluids. You get fever, lethargy. You can lose up to 90% of your lactation. Now imagine if that was in a system where we're talking on a very milk-heavy basis, and we know that pasteurism is dependent upon milk. If CBPP can lose 90% of your um, lactation, but only kill 15% of your herd, what does that mean for overall production long term? And you can hear, you can see that naive animals, animals that aren't exposed to it, can, you can lose massive numbers. You do recover after three to four weeks. But you get these things called sequestra. Again, don't worry about specifics. But that means in that track on the right there, you can see little nodes that continue to shed that disease continually. We talked about PIs, persistently infected. If you've got M. bovis or CBPP in your herd, you can have a, a massive reduction in capability, in production capacity, and general ability to manage your herd without ever knowing it's there, because everyone looks good. And particularly antibiotic resistance, which is a big topic we we're not going to cover here. The current OIE recommendation is don't use antibiotics because they're not effective, but they make animals look great, which means they continue to shed even though they look great. So actually, understanding local conceptions of what these treatments mean for diseases can have really huge impacts. Um, the last thing to mention about CBPP is it's on the international radar in a big way. Okay? This is a known disease that no one wants. So actually, the ability to inspect and vet these, can uh, these, um, these cattle is a massive barrier to international trade, potentially. Okay, and understandings of what it goes. Local trade, obviously, there's a very much a, a national base, national variation of what goes on. But if you're thinking about entering those national, international chains, this suddenly becomes very, very relevant for an, a hard to spot disease. So just to kind of bring this back round, um, remember that word cloud at the beginning? Um, what I did actually was pop up this slide, which is taken from understandings of what diseases are important in pro poor development, livestock diseases. And I'm going to leave without comment the fact that livestock development researchers, stakeholders, disease experts, and the more disease experts are all expert opinions, whereas farmers are just farmer opinions. Okay? So we'll just, just leave that one hanging right up there, okay? But if we pick out these ones specifically here, you can see on the left in the middle, FMD, foot and mouth, tranosomiasis. We've learned about that. CBPPs there, rinderpest. But if we move to the farmer side of things, farmer understandings are fever, diarrhea, anorexia, ticks. And we start to actually disaggregate this kind of scientific edifice from farmer-led understandings of what's going on. And I think that's one of the things I'd really like you to think about and play out when you're, when you're considering the role of diseases here. Whose language are you speaking and why? Because particularly if we review the diseases, just in general, you can have endemic or exotic. But to the people who live there, that may be something quite different. You don't need to, diseases don't need to kill. Okay? They can have massive impacts on production potential. Different vectors vary in the season. So we've got Rift Valley Fever. Remember, kind of have that big wet upsurge, whereas you might have trips which have got ongoing constant chronicity in wooded areas. And if we consider things like changing climate or in pastoral situations, or my experience, access to grazing or grazing stubble fields. If you've got an intensification of agriculture, you don't have access to those fields. So how does that change whose feces you're coming across, which areas you're forced to move through or go through? And as we said with CBBP, domestic and international policies can massively shape people's responses. And if you're using techniques like quarantine inspection um, or meat inspection or blood sampling, this often happens in one locale. People understand from settled agriculture that you can bring cattle to a market. Now, think about what that does from disease spread. If you have disease spread by the breadth of cattle and you've got 10,000 cattle located in an area before you can send them overseas, how does access to that market change on a disease basis? And if you think about detection diagnosis from that, you've got to have the skills, you've got to have the equipment, you've got to have the understandings in that context to understand what you're actually looking for and how you're looking for it. And once you've found it, well, there are loads of options. But if we take the vaccines we're talking about, most vaccine schedules, particularly in West Africa, but I'm sure globally, are often run at a national, le uh, national or international level. Countries will typically vaccinate against something. But anthelmintics, which are worm treatments, majority are left to the herder. You buy them what you want from the shop when you think it's appropriate. So we treat these two diseases, despite the fact they are livestock diseases, in very different ways, with the responsibility and resources delegated to different levels there. So just bringing out the kind of the pastoralism 
to this, just to round up. In my view, mobility changes this game. Okay? Intensification versus extensive systems, we've talked about already. But if you're moving across areas which have endemic disease, if you're being forced to localise in markets, then spread back out again, these are things that really change the conversation. And also if you're using exotic versus indigenous breeds. I mean, I've come across so many pastoralists yeah. when talking, particularly in northern Kenya, talking about uh, interventions and what kind of the way they view development interventions. And I want artificial insemination for my uh, goats has been a, a conversation that comes up again. Now, AI is the use of semen from a selected breed to bring in. The fact that pastoralists are fully aware of this as a technique is fantastic. But the, the importance of bringing, for example, a high meat yielding animal into those things which have problems which are called dystocia, or they can't give birth, you just shift the problems into a different realm, and you have a different system and the different decisions you've got. Now, the zoonotic potential we talked about, but if you think again about pastoralists, um, bloodletting, the use of milk to feed children, these are very intimate links with your animals. And if you haven't seen the Cronke and Garade papers, um, I think Cronke has got this wonderful example of talking about zoonoses where, well, no, no, the disease isn't the same between cattle, uh, between cattle and people because if my, animal, if my cow's fine but I'm sick, how could it possibly be the same disease? So, you know, understandings of where these disease vectors go from and the links between things can be very, very different and force us to think in different ways about that. And then just to kind of bring down, we've talked about herd composition numbers and things like that, but actually we talked about the Hajj very slightly, about um, selling animals for um, festivals. Uh, the, again, coming back to the Gabra, people will typically sell animals on the basis of condition. It's a good goat, it's a bad goat, it attracts a different price. The moment the Hajj comes, people completely shift into a slightly more intensive life, uh, fodder system because they know that the Ethiopian market buyers will buy on kilo weight, which isn't something that the Gabra would normally do. So they suddenly start cramming in lots of fodder to try and up the per kilo weight of these animals, which shifts the metabolic chain, the levels that you've got within the animals, and you've got then a different plane of nutrition, which comes with different diseases. Okay, so even within that, you change that. And then the last thing is, is the logistical access. You all know your areas, you know what you do and don't have access to, but things like vaccination, often an hour, 99% of vaccines require a cold chain. They require the vaccines to stay cold to go out there, and then to be uptaken. And we often have a lot of reports where people won't vaccinate unless their friend does. So finding that early adopter is a problem. Disease monitoring, reporting, community animal health workers, participatory epidemiology, all these are approaches which attempt to deal with these problems that are difficult, interesting, but are problems that pastoralists have dealt with for tens of thousands of years. How do yours do it? 